Hi everyone, I'm Margaret Barrett and I work in validation at NI. Today we're talking about embedded software, specifically how to test it. Now as technology in virtually all industries from industrial machinery to medical devices, cars and planes gains complexity, the number of lines of code is exploding. And obviously it's totally impractical to test this software on production hardware in the real world, so we need to bring the real world into the lab. Hardware in the Loop, or HIL, is the way to do just that. Using a software model to capture real-world scenarios and pairing it with real I.O. allows embedded software to receive inputs, make decisions, and send outputs just like it will in production, but still in the lab, where you can iterate and refine the code. Today we're going to walk through a typical HIL system and pay special attention to model integration. Okay. A typical HIL system is going to consist of a DUT, some signal conditioning, data acquisition, and software. The crux of an HIL system is the model. This is the ticket to the real world, and it's really step one of standing up an HIL system. At NI, Veristand is our application software for validation testing. So let's start there by bringing in Senior Product Marketing Manager Christopher Iverson to answer our questions around model integration. Hey, Chris. Hey, Margaret. So can you show us how to integrate a model in Veristand? Absolutely. And it's like you said, you know, you, you'd want to take the real life scenarios and test it in the lab. Right. And you want to do that for multiple reasons. If you think about it, so today's um, example is going to be a wind turbine. Think about taking that into the real world, setting it up, and then running it. And then, by the way, you're validating if this thing is working. It's very costly to do that with something like a wind turbine, but also it could be a danger. You could create a safety hazard for the people actually validating it because you don't actually know if the software you're running is working yet. That's the whole point of validation. Absolutely. So, so yeah, so it's, it, it's, it's very important that you can do this. And, and for us, we're using Veristand, uh, application-based validation software. And... I'm going to switch over now and show you how you can load in a model that we built in Simulink and kind of run through different real life scenarios. Perfect. So Let's if we it. switch to very stand here, I am now on the mapping diagram. This is where we start. The mapping diagram is where you map your inputs and your outputs to physical hardware or to math that you need to do. But for now, what we're going to do is we're just going to go in here and we're just going to choose this simulation model and I'm going to drop it on the mapping diagram. And then I'm going to point to my CDLL that we compiled from the simulate code. So let's go in here. I happen to know it's in the subfolder. That's how I build it. And I'm going to open it. And now it will load into various stand. So now it's loaded. So now we have a model. And we know it's loaded into various stand without any error. So that's the first good step. So now what we want to do is we want to go up here and we want to just deploy it. So deploy it means that now we're actually running it and we can start interacting with it in Veristand. So we can start setting inputs and outputs and sending it different values and see how it reacts. Again, that's one of the crucial steps in validation, right? Because you're really testing the boundaries of your model, what happens in these corner case scenarios. So now it's connected. You can see that up here in the, in the corner here. It says connected up here. So now the model is actually running. And we can see that in the channel data viewer down here. So you can see the model time. You can see the step, step time duration. All of those are running. And you can see imports and outports. Those are both set to zero right now here. So what we want to do is we want to manipulate them. So let's go up and create a screen. A screen is where we can set these different values and start really interacting with the model. So let's do that. I'm going to drop a control. And this numeric control is going to be connected to wind speed. So I dive into my model here, find my model that's been loaded, and here's imports and wind speed. So one important thing to note about this particular application is the, the wind speed is a function of how much power we get out. Okay. Right? So this particular wind turbine can generate up to 150 kilowatts of power at 20 meters per second. So at winds for 20 meters per second, it will start maxing out 150 kilowatts. Got um, it. Okay, good. So there's a couple of more 
um, parameters we need to think about. One is the cut-in speed. The cut-in speed is where the generator actually begins to generate, generate some output. That's seven meters per second. So at seven meters per second, we start actually generating some power. Okay. At 28 meters per second, we have a cutoff uh, wind speed. Okay. That means this is where... This is where we tie it back, right? When we start thinking about this validation stuff and, and like if you had 28 meter per second winds, it starts getting dangerous because you can actually damage some of the mechanical yeah. stuff in the turbine and so on. And, you know, you want to make sure it breaks at that point and this, that the <laughs> software actually tells it to break. Right. And that's what we're going to be testing here. Okay. So another benefit of bringing it into the lab is really, you know, you don't have to wait for 28 meter per second yeah. winds like you would have to do in the real life. So that's, that's also a benefit. So let's go back here. I'm going to drop a chart because we kind of want to see what's, what has happened over time to a wind speed. So I'm going to just drop the chart here and I'm going to map my chart. So what I want to see is the same import. It's the wind speed, right? So that's what I'm going to show in my graph. Right now, it'll just say zero because I haven't changed my control up here. So if I start changing my control, you'll see the step function on the graph. So that makes a lot of sense. So let's just change the um, label on the axis here because we know that we wanna go up and test up to 35, um, 35 meters per second. So I'm gonna change my axis. That's as easy as that on the right hand side. And then one other thing we can do is we can show the limits. So I want to show a limit starting at 28. So my upper limit at 28 is now red. So when we hit that limit, we can visually see that the, when the when the um, wind speed hits that limit, we're in the red zone. Okay. So I'm going to add this lower limit also, which was our seven. That's where we cut in. I'm going to change the color to yellow. And I'm also going to change the color of the actual um, graph to something else than red so we don't confuse it with the red upper bounds. So let's make that blue for now. There you go. So as I start changing the wind speed here, again, you can see the step function and you can see we start moving in out of the yellow area. So one thing I want to point out, now we have wind speed of seven. So after, when I press up one more time, we're going to generate output. So once our, our wind speed increases, we'll start seeing output. So right now it's zero. So if you keep an eye down here, if I go up to eight, see now we're generating 11.538 kilowatts. So now we're actually interacting with the model. We're, we're showing, what we're showing is we're changing the wind speed that would come from an anemometer or whatever they, they mount on their wind turbine. And that input actually now starts generating some output on the other end, which is great. So what we would like to see in addition to this is obviously the output of the power. So let's put that in a graph as well. So I'm going to do drop another chart. And notice I'm doing all this while the whole thing is running. So I'm going to drop another chart over here. Just going to scroll over some, so we have some room. And in this case, I am going to, instead of mapping it to an import, I'm going to map it to an output because we want to visualize the power. Makes sense. So there we go. And again, we need to change our axes here. And we know we can go up to, if you recall, 150 kilowatt, yeah. 150 kilowatts, right? So let's do 165 here in this case. So we have a little bit of room. And now you can clearly see the, the amount of power being generated. All right. So that's step one. So now we have a visualization, which is really cool, right? So now you can start changing things. And I'm just going to move things around a little bit so we have a little bit more room to to visualize here and again this is all we are running the model and you can interact with the model and you can add the things that you need while the model is running which is very beneficial especially when you're debugging um, so you can also imagine that when you're testing a wind turbine right it's there's a lot of functionality that you might want to test and it's kind of tedious to go move this one integer at a time and see the step function so what we have built into Veristand is what we call the stimulus profile editor, where yes. we can create stimulus profiles. Basically, we're replicating real-world scenarios that we want to run through. So I already created one, so I'm just going to open it down here. I have it open. So let's see. This is what my first validation is going to be. It's going to be we're setting the wind speed to zero. Then we're going to ramp up to 
30 meters per second over 10 seconds. And what we want to see is when it hits 28 that it actually breaks, which is represented by a drop in output of power, right? Because when it breaks, we're not generating any output. Makes sense. So that's what we're wanting to see. Then we're going to ramp down to 28 and say 28 is actually a critical point. We want to make sure when it hits 28 meters per second that it's still stopped or stopping. And then at the end, we're going to ramp down to um, zero again. So that's just a, a scenario that I'm going to run here. So let's see while it's running and i could still interact with it i'm just going to run it here i'm just going to move this over so we can actually see so i'm going to run here and now what you'll see is first of all over on my wind speed it dropped to zero and it's starting to ramp up and as it comes out of the yellow zone on the graph we start generating output but then as it hits the 28 meters per second over here we see a sharp decline here in the, because we're breaking the the wind turbine so we're not generating any output anymore now we're ramping back down to 28 meters per second. Still no output. That's exactly what we wanted to see. And now we're ramping it back down. So we see the curve here. So we're going from full power output and down to zero, right? So this is just one way that you could run a scenario in Veristand and actually test some of your boundaries. And again, as I said, you know, that you could imagine that there's thousands or hundreds of these scenarios that you want to run right so so pretty cool that's great chris thanks for that overview so you showed us how we can bring in a model from simulink or i know veristank is also compatible with lots of modeling environments how we can manipulate those parameters and even run a stimulus profile so kind of a ready-made uh, program for testing uh, the response of that model but one of the things that we talked about that's really crucial to hardware in the loop is that it can interact with physical I.O. Um, so let's kind of bring that full circle here of how that model interacts with hardware. And I actually have an HIL rack with me today, and I'm going to point out some of the hardware pieces and then turn it over to you, Chris, so you can show us how we can incorporate those with the model in Veristand. So here in the rack, uh, we have a couple of data acquisition options Compact Rio here, as well as PXI. Uh, and then another really key element of an HIL system is going to be signal conditioning. And to address that, we have an option called switch load and signal conditioning, or SLSC. And that's that chassis here. What's really cool about it is it is a modular approach to signal conditioning. What's great about that is it really cuts down on custom engineering that you're going to have to do to address your unique signal conditioning concerns and gives you a way that you can easily respond to changing test requirements by popping in and out modules as you need to. So Chris, how do we take this hardware and hook it up with what you just showed us? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. And, and you know what, Margaret, we see this all the time because we see it in integration labs where you have a physical device that you want to interact with. So imagine in our case, if we keep building on our, on our turbine example, that you have the actual physical break that you want to see it engaging when we set a certain output high when we reach 28 meters per second. So that's what we're going to build. But, but just to complete that thought, you know, this break, there might, it's like when you drive in your car, you visually break to the level that you need to, right? right? If you're coming up to a red light, you're kind of stopping slowly. But if if someone runs out in front of your car, you're kind of slamming on the brake. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and you don't want to do that all the time with a wind turbine. You you want to break it in a, in a safe manner and get it to a halt, right? So this brake might have software itself uh, on itself and, and a system, a controller, that is actually controlling how hard does it break based on different parameters that's that's interfacing with other things within the wind turbine and all these things so now what you're actually doing is you're starting to when you do it in an integration lab like this you, you're starting to actually interface with the real live hardware running a real live um, software which is yeah. exactly what you want to see yeah so let's jump into very stand again okay. so i can show you how we connect to hardware so we're back in our very stand environment here. And on the left, I have this um, little menu and we can switch back to the mapping diagram if we want to. That's how we go, go back and forth between things. What we want to do now is add hardware. So I want to go to the system explorer. 
So this will load up an explorer where I can add in the hardware I have. So that could be FPGA modules. It could be digital analog. It could be if you have some strain or specific signal conditioning. We talked about SLSC or switch load and signal conditioning, uh, that approach. And, and all of that you would control from in, within the, the system explorer. So right now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add a digital output so we can see we're good, how we interact with it in better Cool, let's do so, it. Yeah, so here in targets, controller, and under hardware, then we, there we have a chassis, and I can add, add my back device in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right-click and say add back device. So in this case, what we have is a digital output, right? So imagine we had a PXI with a with a module in it exactly as a PXI with, with a digital module in it. And we want to tell that output when we reach 28 meters per second, you need to go high. So that's what we're going to do now. So PXIE, we're just going to call it the model name for now. And I'm going to choose which device it is. You can see here, there's a lot of different devices that you can choose from. So it's all depending on what you have in your system, which is again, very unique depending on what you're testing and, and what industry you're in and so forth, right? So I'm just going to choose PXIE 6509 here. And it says select channel type to add. So what channel type do we want to add? Well, this is an output, so I'm going to change it to digital output. And then I don't need to set anything else, so I can just say next. And now I can choose, do I want to add a line? Do I want to add a port? Do I want to add multiple ports? What do I actually want to add? And it all depends on what you're interfacing with, right? So I'm just going to, for the sake of it, add the port so we can see how we visual represent, visually represent that in Veristand. So I'm just going to choose port zero and imagine that digital output zero is where we communicate with the brake. So I'm going to press finish here. Now, of course, like everything, we have to save it. Now we're saving that we have access to these channels. And as I close the system explore, my mapping diagram actually updates, and now you see the 6509 right here on the mapping diagram. So now I can start interacting with that. So if I start pulling down here and just expanding, you can see all the digital outputs in, in this node that represents the 6509, and that's how we start communicating with it. So right now, I'm just going to move, just because of the way I'm going to set it up, my, uh, my inputs and outputs to the left side. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to take our model because it's still we're still testing this model right now we're just testing it in the context of interfacing with a real life piece of hardware or physical device so i can expand this as well and i have different parameters that i can see about the model but i can also just click here and say i want to look at the wind speed so now i have the wind speed so i'm just going to um, collapse it a little bit again so we don't have so much clutter on our mapping diagram. So again, I'm going to right click and I'm just going to go into terminal placement and put it on the right. Now, there's a couple of things that are important here. So now we have an import where we show where we, what we are outputting is actually the, the, the wind speed, the current wind speed that we're setting uh, either with our stimulus profile or directly on our screen. So what we want to do is we, we don't just want to add that directly to the digital output. We have to tell the digital output at some point this has to go high, right? Or one versus a zero. So we have some math functionality over here. So if I click here, this is the same place I found the simulation model. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a conditional function instead. So I'm just going to drop that. And on my right hand side here, I can set the behavior of it. So what we want to do is we want, to, we want to set constant values, and we want to say when the input, which is x, reaches 28, so 28 is the threshold, so that's the y, 28, then we want to output a 1, which is the w value here, and if, it's not, if it hasn't reached 28, we just want to output 0. Does that kind of make sense? Makes sense, yep. Perfect. So we're just going to wire it up now. So I'm going to wire it here, and I'm going to wire it over here. And technically, now we've already um, we've already wired it up, and we are actually interfacing with the hardware. So if we deploy it and run at this point, it actually works. So let's do that real quick so we can just see it. The thing is, 
my integration lab is not right here, right? Yeah. So I can't actually physically see this break breaking. So maybe what I want to do is I want to show a visual on the screen. Yeah. So also just to be able to log and say, hey, the wind speed is actually getting to that level. So let's visually indicate we're getting there. And imagine in a lab, the first run or two runs, you might want to make sure everything works well and everything is integrated correctly. So then you look at it and see it actually starting to, to activate the brake. But for, for our purposes, we want to put in just a little bit of a Boolean here so we can see that the brake actually engages. So let's just put in a round LED and we're going to bind that in our, now we have something called a calculated channel. And that was our conditional formula. The output of that is a calculated channel. Okay. So I didn't name it. I just called it conditional. So that's what, what we're going to call it. So I'm going to map it to that one, conditional. So what it will say is, if I go over here on the right, if it's true, let's change it to green. And if it's false, let's change the color to red. So now we have a visual representation. I can make it a little bit bigger here so it's easier to see. Right? And I can change the label. Let's call it break activated. There you go. Cool. So now we have a visual representation, but not only, we also on the back end connect it to digital output zero. So when we hit those critical 28 meter per second winds, we send a signal to our brake saying, hey, brake, start engaging. So let's see that it works. So I'm going to change the wind speed here. I'm going to start going up. And you see brakes activated is still red, so that's good. So now we're actually generating output power like what we saw before. I'm going up here, 15, and now we're hitting 20. So we have the max weighted output at this point, so that's great. And let's see when we hit 28. And they're 29. There you go. All right. So we need, so break is now activated and we can visually see that. And you can think about that in the way that if you, again, if you had the device there, you can see it on the screen that the software is actually telling you and you can visually see it as you're starting to, to integrate your test and make sure everything yeah. works together. So we can really see it on the physical device as well. We can see it on the physical device. So, so it's, it's fairly simple, right? You need to map both the, um, the outputs or imports that you have on your model to some, if you have a condition, to the conditional formula or some other formula that you might want to run it through. And then you connect it to the physical channel on the device and you're engaging from model all the way through a physical device in your, in your lab. Awesome. Well, so that kind of brings all of the parts together. But one more question that I have is, you know, test requirements change a lot. Um, at NI, we uh, like to talk about an open approach to testing, meaning that we really want to put the engineer in charge of their system and we want to enable them to make changes. How difficult is it to make changes to a system like this with the software we've been talking about today? How nimble is this solution? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, with the modular approach we talked about, and, and you have the rack right there, you can switch in and out different boards depending on your requirements. And, and that's crucial when you're in a validation lab because you might want to be able to reuse something or you might need to scramble to do a, a test real quick. And, and you need the flexibility to, ha to change out modules as your requirements change. And that's really important. So you can imagine a wind turbine where they might be running some proprietary kind of bus or based on different voltages. It's not just plus minus 10 volts anymore, right? It, it's a lot higher voltage. So that's why it's crucial to have a front end signal conditioning um, approach such as the SLSC where you, can, where you can add in the boards that you need and take a high power signal and transform it into something the measurement system such as the compact rio or the pxi can actually read which is typically plus minus 10 volts right something like that so that's where that comes in the next thing is is actually the connection points between that signal conditioning 
and the actual measurement system tends to get really expensive because as we as we add more things to it, we we typically have point-to-point -point wiring, and that introduces errors. It introduces troubleshooting that takes a long time. And it we affects see these us big rat's we, nest of wires. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And think about you're trying to get a product to market faster, right? Like that is just a sunk cost that you're experiencing right there. That just takes a lot of time. And and with SLSC, we have connections in with using. Uh, commercial off-the-shelf cables. So it's in banks instead of just points to points. So it makes it just a little bit easier and make you just a lot more nimble on the hardware side. So that was the hardware side of it, right? But the software side, it's it's really what we just saw. You you just saw me go into the System Explorer, add a, add a PXIE 6509, which is a digital output device and digital input, depending on the setting, and that's how you do it, because our PXI platform is, is the same way and our Compact Video platform is the same way. You have the boards that you plug in, and then they will show up, and you can find them in the System Explorer, and you can connect to them. And you, as you connect to them and as you add them to your project in the System Explorer, they will show up on the mapping diagram, and you can start interacting with it. So really, that whole piece of it is fairly simple. Now... There are other considerations, right? Because the back end of it is, well, we saw that I created a stimulus profile to actually engage with the board. So that might change, but that's the actual test that you're running. So sure. you have to be aware that as you're changing things and your hardware, you add it and you connect it up, but you need to interface with it in the right way in your test. And that comes down to your test requirements, right? Absolutely. So it's not as hard as you might, might think, but... But there are, there's like with everything, there's some work to it, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hard problems are hard, right? Um, but I want to ask one final question. So we were talking about clicking around in Veristan to add hardware and configure things. It seems like there was a lot of configuration-based functionality right out of the box. But what if I'm working on something with, uh, let's say, like a custom communication protocol or something really unique and proprietary to my test? How can I get that functionality in Veristand? Yeah, that's a great question too, because you know we 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 try to add as much general functionality as we can. But I think you even said it like. It's cross industries that validation is, is becoming more and more prevalent because of this complexity in, in devices that we need to test. And and we as as much as we wanna account for every scenario, we can't. So we have something we call custom devices, and it's not as scary as it sounds. It's really a plug in based architecture that you can use to interface with proprietary things. Now you need to develop that plugin or on our GitHub page, there's actually a lot of different contributors, not only us, but 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 also some of our partners and and users. They have all contributed with a custom device that you can download and then use in Veristand. So say something, we, we've recently released an instrument add-on where you can communicate and set up RS 485 or 232 or whatever you need to or what whatever serial protocol you're you're working with or TCP or Modbus or whatnot right and and you can create the messages that is being sent on that bus and then you can start interacting and sending those based on a scenario in your test and from your mapping diagram and all that so there's a lot of functionality that you can add to Veristand and there's a lot of functionality already built um, and if you can't find what you're looking for, again, there are partners out there that can help you or you can engage with us and we can we can help you with or how you, you can get program it that. yourself, right? Exactly. Exactly. Awesome. So, well, thank you, Chris. Yeah. You know, and I um, one of the things that we love is that we get to work with customers across so many industries and we get to bring that spectrum of knowledge to you as you work on HIL testing. And our belief is that you do your best testing when the testing technology gets out of the way and you are left to be the expert and do what you do best. So I hope that this has been helpful for showing you how you can integrate models with Veristan, pair that up with some powerful hardware. So happy testing, everyone.